Good afternoon. I'm Heather Nowert, a senior fellow here at the Hudson Institute, and we're here to talk about a very timely subject, and that is how governments are dealing with the coronavirus response. We have authoritarian regimes versus democracies, and their approach to coronavirus has been very different. And one of the areas we're really going to focus on today is what does this mean for the march of freedom around the world? Will freedom continue to expand, or is this something that we'll see uh, pulled back on significantly. Uh, we've got a great team of experts here to talk about it, and I'd like to introduce you to some of those. Uh, we have uh, Blaise Mishal, who's a fellow at the Hudson Institute. He focuses on the Middle East, Europe, and strategic competition. Uh, and this conversation, by the way, was his brainchild. So uh, Blaise, thanks so much for assembling the panel here today. Thank you. Uh, we also have Dan Twining. Uh, Dan is president of the International Republican Institute, really a terrific group that helps to promote freedom and democracy around the world with new governments and also governments that are having a little bit of difficulty with that. Uh, Dan has teams or did have teams in place all around the globe to help out with this effort. So Dan, you're perfect for this panel today. And then finally, Dr. Tori Tossig. Uh, she's a research director at the Project on Europe and Transatlantic Relationships at Harvard's Kennedy School Belford Center. And she's also a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, so good afternoon to all of you. Um, anxious to talk about this topic. And uh, I guess the, this question we should start out with is, will coronavirus enable autocratic regimes to grab more power from its people and populations? Or do we think there will be an increase in freedom uh, from some of these countries and some of these movements around the globe. Uh, Tori, why don't we start with you? Great, thank you very much, Heather. This is an interesting time to look at democratic trends around the world, particularly as we're seeing both the democratic and authoritarian governments take truly extraordinary measures to try to control this pandemic. To date, I think we've had over 80 countries um, enact emergency laws and emergency measures in their countries, which have subdued a number of uh, ongoing protests, democratic movements, democratic energy that we saw before the pandemic. Uh, just to kind of give an, a, a wrap-up statement now or an overview statement now, I'm hopeful that uh, the, the trends that we saw in democratic progress before this pandemic will reemerge, but we're certainly at a time of of uh, uncertainty uh, in democracies and authoritarian systems around the world. And a lot will be determined by uh, democratic and authoritarian responses, both domestically and internationally to this crisis moving forward. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're optimistic. Uh, Freedom House did a report uh, last year, as they do very often, that said that uh, democracies were actually, um, were not on the rise, that it was in fact the opposite. So Dan, uh, what are your thoughts on that? So look, Heather, thank you for having me, Blaze, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, we should not uh, treat this health crisis as something that doesn't involve politics. This global health crisis emanated from an authoritarian regime's repression of media and medical and official reporting of this pandemic. Uh, if China had had an open and free society, an open and free press, normal reporting lines, arguably, we would not all be uh, in lockdown, right? So politics is not something separate from the crisis. Politics is part of the crisis. Uh, we have seen democracies handle this stress test very well, uh, including in places like South Korea and Taiwan and Germany and other countries. We have seen uh, some authoritarian regimes handle it very badly. Uh, many authoritarian societies uh, were terribly placed even coming into the pandemic. Think about Venezuela and the human misery and desperation before coronavirus and then what this terrible pandemic is doing to further fracture uh, that society. So uh, politics is very much part of this. Uh, we see authoritarians trying to take advantage of the crisis to uh, uh, persecute political opponents, uh, to spread disinformation that weakens the West. I mean, there are lots of political agendas at work here. We also see just really heartening stories of citizen-led civic responses. Uh, we see uh, lots of democracies where strong institutions are part of the solution, not part of the problem, right? Uh, and I think the, the story is yet to be written, including in countries like Russia, 
where Putin began saying, ah, this is a function of Western decadence. Look at all these Western democracies, right? Before it hit home in his own country. Uh, and he essentially went dark in the media because the thing is now uh, uh, a terrible burden on him and is reminding many Russians that maybe uh, they wish they had a government that had not stolen and looted so much of the country's wealth for the past 20 years and maybe invested in some public health institutions. Well, you hit on a lot there, and those are some of the topics that we'll, we'll cover as well, including the massive disinformation campaign that we're seeing, uh, not just ch from China, but Russia, and then also Iran. And that's something that democracies all around the world are now going to have to struggle with and are still struggling with getting out the message on that. Uh, Blaze, let's go to you and uh, get your take on what, how you see this ha unfolding. Thanks, Heather, and, and thanks to Dan and Tori for, for joining as well for what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating discussion. Uh, to pick up on what Dan was saying about the political nature of this crisis, I'd go a step further and say that uh, it's actually demonstrating something that I think we knew but maybe wasn't evident or wasn't forefront in our minds beforehand, uh, which is that uh, the world isn't just divided between democratic countries and authoritarian governments. Uh, but it's actually pitched in a competition between these two political systems, uh, where particularly authoritarian countries are trying to expand their reach uh, and convince more countries to join their side. And I think that's what we've been saying, seeing uh, in the aftermath of this uh, of the spread of the coronavirus, particularly through these propaganda and disinformation campaigns that, that you just mentioned, Heather. Uh, and I think in the short term, uh, there might be some advantages for uh, authoritarian forces. Uh, what makes democracies work, uh, whether it is uh, elections, is going to be a lot harder in an age of pandemic. We've already seen numerous countries uh, postpone elections, uh, including Ethiopia and Sri Lanka and Ecuador. Uh, some countries are going ahead with them, like Poland, in just a couple of days. Uh, but it's contentious as to whether they should be having elections when people can't gather. Uh, at the same time, uh, sort of the forces of democracy, like popular protests that we saw all across the world last year, from Hong Kong through Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, uh, into Africa and South America. Uh, those are really hard to have when uh, when people are sheltering in place. Uh, and so, in the short term, I think there might be some advantage to authoritarian forces. But I think in the longer term, you're going to see, uh, as Dan was saying, that democracies are going to weather the storm better. And even if they don't, uh, they provide people with the means of voicing their dissatisfaction and changing their governments that don't do a good job of dealing with this crisis. Uh, where autocracies are going to see a buildup of public dissatisfaction that I think is going to lead uh, to political upheaval in the long term. Uh, well, a lot to go over here, but uh, Blaze, one of the things that you hit upon, and I'd love to get everyone's take on this, is, is sort of an alliance forming of these countries that are autocratic that would like to see more governments adopt, other governments adopt that kind of uh, government representation. So do you mean you see this coming together between Iran, Russia, and China, or do you see other blocks from around the world? And, and anyone take a, take a shot at this, um, at answering this, but do you see that, where do you see that happening and what countries do you talk about? Sure, I'm not sure that I'd call it a, a block in the form of uh, some sort of well-structured alliance. Um, but it is pretty mm -hmm. amazing the way that you see the sharing of techniques and tools and tropes uh, across, uh, particularly, as you mentioned, Russia, Iran, and China. Uh, you've seen Iran pick up on disinformation that China has spread about the possibility that the coronavirus was actually created and originated uh, in the U.S. military. Uh, you've yeah. seen China adopt Russian disinformation tools uh, and use uh, social media in the U.S. to try to spread misinformation. Uh, and so there is yeah, definitely right uh, share 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 tactics going on. I want to bring Tori into this because I see her nodding quite a bit right there. And, um, you know, Tori, it, it's pretty, it's fascinating that China, which normally would speak in far more diplomatic, flowery tones, has really become very pointed in its criticism of America and audacious in its claims that America uh, developed this virus and unleashed it on the world. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth, but they're being very pointed in, in trying to call out America and uh, take us to task on this. What are your thoughts on that? 
It's been worrying uh, to see the the tactics that Chinese disinformation actors have picked up on in the last few weeks throughout the coronavirus pandemic. As Blaze mentioned, they seem to be borrowing a number of tactics from the Kremlin's playbook. Uh, by that, I mean mm -hmm. using fake social media outlets to spread conspiracy theories. Uh, also, we're seeing Chinese diplomats, even the Spokesperson from the Chinese Foreign Ministry himself said that this was a virus that was originated uh, in the U.S. or spread by U.S. troops, which is not only uh, inaccurate, but disturbing to see where China is taking its disinformation campaign. I also think it's important to take a step back and look at what Russian and, and Chinese tactics and objectives were vis-a-vis -vis the West before the pandemic started. And I think it was very clear, even if not acting in coordination with one another, that both Russia and China benefit from disunity and a lack of cohesion in the West, in the United States and Europe. And it's been particularly interesting to see China's kind of charm offensive or mass diplomacy when it comes to Europe, because China is very much pushing its objectives through these kind of new uh, reinforced dis disinformation tools and information campaigns, for example, making China out to be a global a uh, partner of first resort, uh, China being there for Europe when the United States is not. And sadly, I think the disunity that we're seeing between the US and Europe is only uh, allowing for China to enhance these actions and take them further in Europe. Uh, so I think the big story with, with this information here has not actually been from the Russian actors, but more how China has picked up on some of the Kremlin's playbook mm -hmm. and pushing it in a much more aggressive manner. Well, Russia's been so successful at turning Americans on one another, and as they've fiddled in other countries as well, I think you're exactly right that China has watched that very carefully and is now deploying that. To what ex to what extent they will be successful, I think that's that's still to be determined. But um, it was almost comical to watch as China and Dan. I'd like to get your take on this. As China was sending out uh, equipment to some of those European countries, and I recall. Uh, sending some um, PPE to Finland, for example. And then Finland received it and said, well, wait a minute, this stuff doesn't even work. And you saw China do that all around Europe. Um, so at what point, Dan, do countries say, hey, China, this is just bogus? So, I mean, one thing to really hone in on here, Heather, is the connection between Chinese domestic political imperatives and their foreign policy playbook as regards to COVID. Uh, in addition to the examples you've described, we've also seen in every country where China has delivered assistance, the Chinese embassy has requested uh, or demanded in return that the leadership of those countries stand up and publicly thank China and the Chinese Communist Party and the great leader Xi Jinping. And so part of what's going on here, uh, it's not just to think about China as a country that, Tori is completely correct. They want to weaken the West. They want to put China closer to the center of world politics, erode our alliances and our leadership. But there is also this feedback loop between the foreign propaganda and the domestic political imperative of convincing the Chinese public uh, that the Chinese Communist Party uh, makes no mistakes, is uh, morally superior, is a visionary party leading China into the 21st century into a position of global prominence, right? Um, and so one, one thing you are seeing with this foreign propaganda and this disinformation is it is feeding back directly to Chinese audiences. Chinese audiences mm -hmm. then see the leader of country X or country Y play, praising Xi Jinping, praising the Chinese Communist Party, and that checks the domestic political box for them in ways that you sort of can't imagine America or European democracy requiring. So that China can then continue to keep its people under their control and under their power. Correct, absolutely. So these things are not separate, they are one and the same. Mm -hmm. So Blaze, do you see that any nations around the world, now that we, of course we know that coronavirus came from China, we know that China stifled, uh, kicked out reporters, they stifled dissent, They've put people who disagreed with the government publicly in jail, or even worse, they've sent faulty equipment all around the globe while uh, demanding that other governments will praise them for it. Um, are nations buying this Chinese sense of good, uh, Chinese goodness, or do you think they're wise um, to what China's really up to? 
That's an excellent question. And I think many countries are very wise to it, or at least getting wise. Uh, it's been incredible to see just uh, in the commentariat here in Washington, uh, the initial alarm that I think was rightly felt uh, about uh, this Chinese charm offensive, as Tory put it, uh, around COVID-19. Um, but that has given way to the realization that a lot of this falls really flat. Um, China does not exercise soft power very well. As you mentioned, uh, the medical assistance that they tried to provide, they both charged countries for and then actually provided faulty equipment in the end. Um, we've seen in Africa where they tried to do the same, provide African countries uh, with medical assistance. Uh, that was quickly soured by a reporting about how the Chinese were treating African migrants inside of China very poorly. Um, and so the, the charm offensive has really failed. But where I do think there should be concern uh, is China's use of more muscular policies. And we've seen this uh, most recently when it came to the EU report uh, that was published last week that it was supposed to include and originally included discussions of these Chinese disinformation campaigns that Tory was just alluding to. Uh, but China used political pressure an economic pressure due to the trading relationship it has with European countries to get that reporting buried. And I think this is the real concern. Uh, China doesn't necessarily exercise soft power very well, but it has what the National Endowment on Democracy called sharp power. Uh, it's able to use some of its political tools to bury dissent. Um, and there's also a technological component to that, which I think we should worry about. Uh, which is it, it tries to get other countries to adopt its technological platforms in the form of 5G and telecommunications equipments, uh, which enables surveillance both by governments of their own people and of China of uh, the rest of the world. And so I think there's still yeah. a lot to come uh, in the way of Chinese attempts to use this crisis uh, to influence world politics and grow their stature. But at least so far, this preliminary mask diplomacy uh, I, I think has been discounted quite broadly. Well, a, a couple points there, and uh, from my time at the State Department, and you all will recall this, the United States talking to European countries and cautioning them about working with Huawei as nations would expand into 5G, and the United States got a whole lot of pushback from many of those countries, including our strongest ally, the UK, about uh, implementing that kind of technology, and now uh, the Brits are taking a close look at uh, working with Huawei because, as the United States explained very clearly, you know, the Chinese government will take this information and take what intelligence that they can get uh, from this technology and use it for their own benefit and to the harm of Western nations. So I think countries are at least starting to take a second look at that. But then a second point that you, you brought up that I want to um, spend a little more time on is uh, China using a strong arm uh, at different institutions and how they're better at the soft power but or not good at the soft power but they're better at the pointed power and a place where we said that, see that is at the United Nations and on the Security Council where uh, China will really strong arm other countries uh, not just at the Security Council but all throughout the United Nations and a prime example of that that I think we're just waking up to now is how China handled things within the WHO uh, would love to get everybody's thoughts on that. Uh, Dan, you want to weigh in? So uh, the United States last year gave 10 times more support to the World Health Organization than did China. Uh, yet the leadership of the World Health Organization very early in this crisis, in January, February, uh, almost seemed to be relaying Chinese Communist Party talking points in first dismissing the transmissibility of the disease, then in sort of dismissing or minimizing its international spread and implications, uh, the Chinese have pursued a rather sophisticated strategy uh, over the past decade plus of uh, insinuating their candidates and candidates from other countries who agreed to sort of follow their line into leadership of all sorts of UN technical organizations and other multilateral bodies. Um, you know, America has always had a rather tortured reputation, uh, sorry, a rather tortured relationship with some of these institutions. Of course, we help stand them up and create them and are often their primary donor. Uh, but in fact, the way multilateralism gives voice, say, to autocracies, uh, gives an equal voice to uh, all countries, 
uh, that can redound to our disadvantage, as you've seen in lots of UN General Assembly votes. So the Chinese have basically uh, figured out that leadership of multilateral clubs is part of their strategy, including for excluding Taiwan. Taiwan was banned from the World Health Organization. Uh, India's admission to the Security Council, Japan's admission has been blocked by China. I mean, we can just go down the list. The Chinese have pursued a policy of excluding rival powers in Asia and beyond and projecting their candidates. And the goal, I think, over time is to build out a world that is more friendly, not simply to Chinese interests in stability and security, but frankly, uh, that is more uh, susceptible to, say, a values-free zone in foreign policy where the Chinese Communist Party is not judged uh, with respect to its autocratic record at home. It's judged very much uh, in kind of morally uh, uh, neutral terms. They're trying to create a world that is safer for uh, Chinese authoritarianism. Dan, I really like how you put that, a values-free zone where nations around the world wouldn't judge, wouldn't criticize China for its human rights abuses or for having kicked out scores of journalists and imprisoned uh, hundreds of thousands or possibly up to millions of uh, Chinese uh, Uyghur Muslims and not being called out. Uh, that's, uh, that's something we really have to watch. Corey? If I could, uh, to kind of tie in a point you were making earlier about China's uh, economic influence in Europe and also Dan's point about creating value-free zones. I mean, Europe has been a really interesting place to watch U.S.-China competition play out over the last even few years. And I think going forward, uh, what happens in Europe, what happens in the Europe-Chinese relationship will affect a lot of what global order, global uh, balance of power looks like in the years ahead. Uh, and if we you know, go back to 2019, it seemed that Europe was taking a little bit of a harder line towards Chinese investments, Chinese political influence. Uh, and when the pandemic started, we saw China, you know, pursue more of this charm offensive, uh, bring in lots of aid and support to Europe, some of which proved to be faulty, uh, in addition to these information campaigns. And what has been interesting to see is kind of this mixed response from, from Europeans. On the one hand, we saw Brits, Germans, and even Italians come out uh, just last month saying that there were concerns about potential Chinese takeovers and buyouts of European companies if there were to be an economic fallout and therefore European governments needed to strengthen, for example, their investment screening mechanisms uh, to try to try to guard against Chinese economic influence. And then on the flip side of that, as Blaze mentioned, we saw this watered down uh, European response to Chinese disinformation. And so I think both of these uh, kind of responses in the last month show that Europe is a little conflicted when it comes to its relationship with China. Europe does not wish to see a decoupled uh, and competitive US-China world in the way that uh, some Americans might be interested in doing. And uh, this pandemic will have an influence on that balance of power and will have an influence on China's role in Europe. And I think we're very much at a deciding point in which direction Europe goes. And right now we're seeing mixed responses at both the European level and the national level. And lamentably, I think that the divisions we're seeing between the U.S. and Europe on the pandemic response is only increasing those vulnerabilities for China to take advantage of, particularly in Europe. Let's talk a little bit about uh, democratic movements and uh, what we've watched over the past year in Hong Kong in particular, where people have taken to the streets uh, to protest um, the movement of uh, those in Hong Kong to extradite uh, citizens to China and what has happened as a result. And just over the weekend, I know we were all watching this as there was the first uh, fairly large scale protest in Hong Kong and police came in and they shut that down. There were about 300 or so people who showed up at a shopping mall. Of course, this comes after about 15 were arrested. I think it was about a week ago or so. Um, so we're starting to see those in Hong Kong speak out against the Chinese government. What do we see happening to that movement down the road? Is that for Blaze, any of us? Uh, Dan, Dan yeah, go ahead, why don't you take a moment? So, um, I mean, I'd be interested in what you all think. I will say that before the, the pandemic struck, people power was on the march all over the world, that you had not seen another year since 1989, 
where more people were in the streets, on the move, protesting against corrupt governance, protesting against oppressive governance. And this was not in lots of comfortable, cozy countries. This was in really tough places like Algeria, like Sudan, like Venezuela, like uh, Hong Kong, right? There used to be an argument uh, a lot of us in the China community used to hear, which is that the Chinese leadership had essentially bought off the Chinese public with a bargain that uh, we put money in your pockets, you become prosperous, middle class, and then you don't worry too much about your political rights. Hong Kong is the richest part of China. Per capita incomes in Hong Kong are higher than they are in the United States in Europe. Yet Hong Kongers have led the campaign for greater political rights and freedoms and dignity. Because of course, having money in your pocket, having prosperity is not enough. You also want the dignity that comes from accountable and responsive politics, politicians that are accountable and responsive to you. So uh, the pandemic has dealt a temporary blow to street protest movements, just because it's not safe to be in large crowds. Um, but in fact, I think you're gonna see over the coming period uh, that a lot of this anger will grow against abuses by autocratic governments, against governments that are not reforming fast enough, responsive enough to their people, uh, because a lot of governments uh, you know, have either dropped the ball uh, in the health crisis or they have used the pandemic to pursue uh, ulterior motives like the Chinese Communist Party cracking down on Hong Kong's rights and freedoms. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad to hear you think this is just going to be a temporary blow to those types of movements. I think we're all in agreement that uh, democracies end up winning in the end because it's what's best uh, for people in a continua continuation of a fair and fruitful society. Um, but so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear you think it's just going to be a temporary blow. Uh, you mentioned something uh, that made me think of the Philippines. And uh, I don't know if this is a good or a bad thing, but uh, President Duterte uh, tried to uh, promote the uh, takeover, basically, of companies. Obviously, that's not a good thing, uh, of the private sector industry. But yet, some of his allies pushed back on that, thinking that he was simply going too far. So there could be a, a price to pay for some of these uh, regimes when they do try to overreach, as we saw what happened in the Philippines. Uh, Blaze, any, any thoughts on those just kind of, not necessarily in the Philippines, but overreach in general? Yes, I think Dan raises a, an excellent point, and I think a lot of uh, people who have been living perhaps contently or quietly under uh, autocracies uh, are beginning to realize that authoritarianism is bad for your health. Uh, and I'm thinking here not just of, of the fact that this outbreak started in China and was uh, was squashed uh, by, by the Chinese Communist Party for so long, uh, but even what happened in Iran, uh, where the Iranian authorities sort of denied that there was a pandemic happening. Uh, they didn't tell people to take precautions, uh, but there was already so much distrust between the society and the Iranian government uh, that even once the Iranian government began to take things more seriously, uh, the people of Iran wouldn't listen to them and instead turned to quack uh, ideas on how to deal with this. And there was a number of deaths in Iran, for example, from people drinking methyl alcohol because a preacher told them that that was one way to, to cure or prevent themselves from getting uh, the coronavirus. And so this distrust that happens between societies and governments and authoritarian regimes is really being brought to the forefront uh, and is being stressed even further in situations like you raised, Heather, uh, in which governments think that this is a good time to flex their muscles and seize even more power. Uh, and so I think you're going to see a lot of people uh, grow dissatisfied with the ineptitude that their governments demonstrate uh, and realize that their lives are being put in danger by whether it is uh, the greed and corruption or, or, or purely disinterest of autocratic regimes and their well-being. And that's going, I think, lead to the desire to, to have more of these popular protests, as Dan was saying. Uh, but so long as there is sheltering in place or there are concerns about renewed outbreaks, uh, that's going to be physically difficult to do, which is why organizations like IRI are really important to help people find new ways to engage in political activism and make sure their voices are heard uh, and engage in popular mobilization. So I think you're going to see a lot of those same forces that brought people to the streets uh, manifest themselves, but we're going to have to find new ways uh, to try to engage them politically. Uh, Dan, as the president of IRI, and I mentioned at the top that you uh, deploy folks all around the world to uh, countries that are either fledgling democracies or countries that are going through an election process. 
and who reach out to you and say, you know, hey, how do we set up these institutions? Um, obviously, your folks aren't able to travel right now. So how do you see that impacting some of those fragile countries where you had been uh, helping to advise some of those new governments? Um, thanks, Heather. So we have offices in almost 50 countries that work out of them into many more countries. Our field staff are still in position. Uh, they too, in many countries, are limited, though it's different in different countries. Some of the restrictions are lighter, uh, depending on the intensity of the pandemic. But the answer is there is a lot uh, to do in the democracy business right now, uh, helping parliaments conduct effective oversight virtually, right? Uh, helping civil society groups organize when governments are not listening to citizen concerns. Civil society can be that counterbalance that feeds in and creates pressure points for governments to put their people first. How do you help them organize virtually and drive their uh, peaceful agendas? Uh, how do you help uh, governments uh, connect with citizens in a period when you can't have the normal uh, town halls, uh, in some cases you can't run a proper election, right? Because the conditions do not warrant. So how do you help make sure that that transmission belt between government and citizens remains intact? How do you help governments understand what their people really need and want? You know, we take it for granted in America, but in lots of countries, public opinion polling is not uh, necessarily an advanced science. And so how do you help make sure that politicians understand uh, that citizens need this kind of relief uh, in the current pandemic circumstance. Um, so there's a lot to do. There's a lot to do uh, in this space. I mean, finally, I would just like to say, Heather, because um, this feeds to kind of when we all reopen and when things begin to normalize again, uh, state power has grown everywhere. The state society balance is not healthy, including in many democracies as a result of the emergency powers that governments have assumed, including democratic governments. That cannot be a permanent condition. We're gonna to have to everywhere, including in the West, make sure that governments go back to having a healthy balance with society, rather than to be too top-down and commandeering and restricting citizen rights and freedoms. Yeah, uh, Tori, can we talk a little bit, and Dan, uh, I'm really glad to hear that your teams are still able uh, to do uh, a large part of their jobs and look forward to when your folks uh, here in, Wa in Washington and elsewhere can get back out in the field too, but glad to hear you guys are still uh, helping freedom on the march. Uh, uh, Tori, can we talk a little bit about, um, about some of those countries that really got it right? Uh, Taiwan, for example, the Republic of Korea, uh, those countries identifying concerns and problems very early on, trying to alert the West. Uh, in the case of Taiwan, uh, they weren't able uh, to get the attention uh, that was necessary and needed at the WHO, lacking representation there. Uh, where do you see things going with Taiwan and, and how did some of these countries manage to get it right? I, well, there's, I'm sorry, don't mean to Taiwan as a country. Obviously, it's one country, two systems under China, but you know what I mean. How did some uh, you know areas manage to get it right? I think looking back at the last two months and the various responses we've seen put in place, uh, as you mentioned, some countries have done better than others. Obviously, those who have done better were those who were able to roll out rapid testing early on, who took measures to um, close down parts of their economy, close down parts of their society early on, take the risk seriously uh, when it became when it became known that this was a, a creeping pandemic around the world. Another country that's done very well, given that it's in the heart of Europe, is Germany. Uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel has been praised for her very pragmatic, uh, almost scientific response to the pandemic. Uh, she's provided cool and calm leadership to her people and has also been very I think, realistic about what the next few months will hold. Uh, but overall, I would say that those societies that have done best have been those that have relied on health and science experts and who have taken the crisis seriously from day one. And where, uh, Dan or uh, Blaze, where do you see things going with Taiwan? Do you see that Taiwan will be able to uh, obtain representation within the WHO? Or will China continue to strong arm other countries to block that? Blaise, go ahead. Well, I think it really depends uh, on the United States at this point and its decision uh, that it has to make, I think, going forward on whether it wants to uh, fix the mistakes that it has rightly seen uh, in the World Health Organization 
which has led President Trump to pull U.S. funding from the organization, uh, or whether it's going to go its own way and, and try to create some other alternative form of, uh, of global health systems. Uh, but I think if the U.S. does re-engage with the WHO, it, it does need to uh, address some of, some of the structural issues that we have seen. Uh, foremost among them is the WHO's leadership, leadership's willingness to completely bury reporting uh, out of Taiwan uh, when it came to came to the beginnings of this of this outbreak. Uh, one of you brought up a, a little bit ago the issue of surveillance. I think it was Dan you mentioned that, and even democracies are kind of trying to figure out a new way of how to deal with surveillance. I was on a call earlier today where um, a, a something was being discussed about using surveillance among uh, companies for employees taking their temperature, uh, monitoring their movements, and all of that. So. How do democracies sort of grapple with these decisions about when there's a p pandemic, it could seem like it's a good idea to monitor people's health and temperature and their whereabouts. But on the other hand, that can be a really slippery slope. Uh, Tori, how do we have that debate here and in other, other democracies? There's a big question about the balance between security and civil liberties taking place across democracies in the world. As I mentioned, over 80 countries have imposed emergency rule, emergency systems measures since the beginning of the pandemic. There is this question of surveillance and tracking and monitoring, and we've seen democracies that have very little appetite for those types of models embrace them in order to get the pandemic and get the crisis under control. I think a big question going forward is how you slowly reduce these types of measures, how you reduce um, uh, emergency measures in place, how you kind of pull back these surveillance tactics that we're seeing used in uh, democratic states. And what I worry is that in countries where there are very few constraints left on the executive, I'll just put forward Hungary as an example in Central Europe. Uh, one of the big reasons that emergency measures put in place by the Orban government are so worrying is because a lot of uh, democratic constraints on the government have been weakened and reduced in years prior to this crisis. And so when we look at how and when these types of emergency measures might be uh, removed, there's not a lot of optimism over when and how the government will actually relax these types of measures. I mean, as another example, we saw um, the government in Turkey impose emergency law after the attempted coup uh, in 2016, and that has yet to be lifted. And so, again, the question is when and how these types of measures are lifted in the future. But for now, it seems that even democratic states have been willing to impose surveillance and emergency measures in order to get the pandemic under control, even if it means losing some of those civil liberties in the time being. Well, uh, get, developing some of those powers and hanging on to those powers is a really tempting thing uh, to want to continue. And so it's tough for some governments to to try to give those up, but we'll have to, it's up to us really to keep those governments uh, accountable and keep our government leaders accountable. But I like how you put it that as we talk about surveillance, there has to be an off ramp too. And so perhaps as we talk to colleagues and talk to the American public and other countries uh, through our own work, that's something that needs to be highlighted. We understand the need for um, some form of surveillance right now, but let's look at a way that that uh, ends up winding down so that we don't erode our own freedoms, whether it's here or in Germany or other countries. Completely agree. Uh, to take a, a broader stance on where we see um, some authoritarian governments that have these uh, surveillance methods already in place, for example, in China. Um, you know, China has been rolling out a digital surveillance model within its country for a number of years now. They're trying to impose this type of or bring this type of um, model and systems to developing countries around the world, uh, even to countries in Europe. And as we see this pandemic play out, as we see governments willing to use some of these surveillance tactics, it will be interesting to see whether uh, some of these Chinese data surveillance models take hold in places that they are already being promoted and sold by the Chinese government. Well, I, I think we've summed it up pretty well, the problem and also some potential solutions. Um, I just wanna get last thoughts from everybody about um, authoritarian regimes versus uh, democratic movements, both trying to be on the march and where we see things going. I've, I've heard a sense of optimism 
from all of you that it could take some time. Uh, there could be some setbacks right now, but you think that, uh, you know, overall going forward, things are looking uh, fairly positive uh, for, for democratic movements. So I'd like to just get everyone's last thoughts. Uh, Tori, let's start with you there. So one of the reasons I mentioned that I was kind of optimistic on the side of democratic movements regaining momentum in the wake of this pandemic is in part because of the inherent weaknesses that we see uh, within authoritarian regimes. And I'll just take two very durable ones at the moment, uh, Putin's Russia and Xi Jinping's China. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that both presidents were strangely absent in various parts of this crisis. Xi Jinping sent his uh, premier Li Keqiang to Wuhan uh, in the early days of the crisis, perhaps in part because he didn't want to be seen as responsible for a crisis that he wasn't sure that he could control. Similarly, in Russia, President Putin was uncharacteristically quiet in some of the uh, early COVID responses when it appeared that it could spiral out of control. Uh, dictators, authoritarian leaders like a crisis when it's something that they can spin and control to their own favor. And I think as we set into the economic fallout from this pandemic, uh, authoritarian leaders are going to be met with a very different type of challenge, a very different type of legitimacy challenge to their control and their rule. And it's one that authoritarian leaders have not stacked up very well against in the past. And so I think as we move forward and as we see the economic fallout take place in this pandemic, some of that inherent weaknesses within authoritarian regimes will start to be seen again. Dan, any last thoughts? Thanks, Heather. This has been great. What a good discussion. Um, look, uh, democracies have uh, executed rather unevenly in this crisis thus far, but I would just like to make maybe a point that we haven't fully fleshed out, which is that uh, when we think about open societies, uh, part of the solution to this kind of emergency is that free and effective media space, that open reporting. So governments' shortfalls can be identified and governments can be held accountable. It's uh, elections and the other tools to make sure that politicians are putting people first or responsive to their citizens. Uh, it's rule of law and courts and effective oversight. It's devolved governance so that one man at the center is not making all the decisions, which is sometimes how the Chinese Communist Party portrays Xi Jinping. That in fact, if you look at the US example, we've had just heroic mayors and uh, governors who have been part of the solution. Here. And so when we think about sort of how uh, countries have performed, we should think not just about the initial phase, but also about how they bounce back, how resilient they are, uh, how focused they are on uh, putting their people first rather than putting their political party or their individual politicians first. Uh, and finally, just the point, uh, Heather, that as we navigate this post-pandemic world, um, you know, innovation is going to be so central to finding a vaccine, to finding workarounds so that people can get back to work. And I just have 100% confidence in the ability of the US and other free and open societies to innovate their way out of a crisis in ways that rigid authoritarians that are very focused on propping up one man or one party are just never going to be able to execute as effectively. So um, in the long term, you know, uh, this has been bumpy here in America, but I'm hoping that it reminds people of kind of the total package of our open systems uh, and why they do matter so much. Mm -hmm. and, and your point about uh, this is something that the media needs to be able to cover and what we saw happen in China with so many members of the Western press thrown out and then we've known for a long time that any uh, media in China that even attempts to criticize the government gets thrown into jail and we've seen some now such as uh, human rights lawyers uh, with the 709 movement that they were you know imprisoned and then some of them let out but it's now called quarantine, which is really code for another form of prison uh, for some of those. But you know, really, China needs to let media in and let them uh, in and report in an unfettered uh, in an unfettered way. Uh, Blaze, let's get get your last thoughts before we wrap things up. Thanks, Heather, and, and thanks to Tori and Dan. I think they really beautifully summed up uh, the state of the world in, in in a way that that that, that pairs well together. Tori highlighting the weakness of authoritarian systems and Dan, the resilience of open and democratic societies. Uh, I think the only thing that I would add to that is that we really shouldn't take uh, either of those for granted, which is to say 
uh, this crisis has revealed the ugly face of authoritarianism to the world, um, but we shouldn't take it for granted that it will crumble on its own, uh, even if those weaknesses that Tori mentioned uh, continue to be exacerbated. Uh, and we shouldn't take for granted that democracies will thrive, even though they have all of the virtues and assets that Dan listed. Uh, it's really going to take work on our part as democratic countries to keep our democracies healthy and functioning, uh, and investments in, in, the, in the democracies and freedoms uh, in other parts of the world to continue to, to undermine uh, the dangerous autocracies that uh, threaten both their own citizens uh, and, and our own health and the stability of international order. Well, I, th I think that's a good place to leave it. This has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, and Blaze, I'm just uh, so thrilled that you put this together and uh, got this team in place from uh, all of our respective places around the country. Uh, so Blaze uh, Michal, uh, my colleague here from Hudson Institute, he's a fellow there. Thank you so much. Uh, Dan Twining uh, from the International Republican Institute. Dan, thank you so much and look forward to seeing you again real soon. And Dr. Tori Tossig, uh, Tori, thank you. It's so nice to meet you. And I look forward to, to speaking with you again as we uh, try to figure out and solve the world's problems. Thank you very much. Thanks, Heather. All Thanks. right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. And we'll talk again real soon. Thank you.